To Your Eternity Season 3 has been officially confirmed, and we have reached the biggest time skip yet. We have officially reached the modern age, and Fushi seemingly has done what he set out to do. He has more or less conquered the world, he's spread his roots, and seemingly a peaceful, normal civilization that's very similar to our own has been built, and the future, the possibility where this author can take it next, modern age weapons, what the knockers can do with it, can his friends once again be revived and potentially live a normal, peaceful life. The possibilities are near endless, and I can't thank this production committee enough for greenlighting a season 3 after already giving us two back-to-back two-core seasons. This was a blessing to watch. It, honestly, the past three weeks, my opinion of the show has gone from this is a top 10 anime to this is a top 5 anime, I leave this episode saying it's probably my top three anime, like that's how much I love what I'm seeing. I knew eventually we would reach the modern age and I knew eventually we would get a big time skip to this degree as it was just kind of self-explanatory. When we look at the massive time jump from season one to two, if Fushi seemingly can create an almost immortal army and he's going to keep spreading his roots, a kind of fast forward time skip to see all of his friends age and live full fulfilling lives. I mean, yeah, you can make the joke Mesar died of an overdose, but that's honestly probably a nice way for him to go out. To see that, it feels like conclusive in one way, but at the same time, the idea of modern age. Season 3 is going to be unlike anything we've seen so far, and I'm so excited to see how this author is once again going to turn a formula we think we understand on its head and become almost a completely new anime. Now, I do have a full live reaction to today's wonderful final episode, so if you want to see my full-on thoughts to this or any of the previous episodes, head on over to my Patreon, consider supporting, as I'm going to miss this one, and I don't think we're going to have to wait too long given the break between seasons 1 and 2, and honestly, I know sometimes people like to nitpick the production, but I honestly think given how long this show was in production between seasons, this show turned out pretty damn consistent, and when you think of the possibilities of nuclear warheads, the modern weapons we currently have, the idea of the knockers potentially getting a hold of that and the threats that could pop up are very threatening and very intriguing. I think I'm most excited to see what's going to happen in Season 3 in the way of potentially new friends and old friends coming back in terms of living a normal life. When we look at March, when we look at Tanari, right, they didn't really live a normal life. So to bring them back into a world potentially where they have libraries, they have amusement parks, they have everything that a normal person would love to enjoy and without potentially the threat of a knocker, I think there's a possibility. I mean, here's the thing, they may not bring any of them back again. By all accounts, they live fulfilling lives with their second chances. But it does, like, a part of me hopes that there's certain characters, whether, honestly, I think Tanari... March and Gugu, those are like the ones I really, really hope get to come back again because they really were heartbroken that Fushi left them almost immediately after coming back to them. So it'd be nice to see them. Bond, of course, I love my boy Bond, but if he had to go out, I think that was a fulfilling end for him. I love the fact that for Fushi, he just, he's such a selfless character by the end of this episode. And to see him back in the boy's form and just kind of like release the rope and be like, fish, oh, berries, fruit, and just is so happy about what he made. I love the fact that they spread it as an almost religion that the roots are here to protect us. And I love the kind of concept of how he became a god in a way, because when you think about what people believe in God in our own world, it's like something you can't interact with, but it's there protecting you or guiding you, and that's almost like what Fushi became in this episode. Something that people don't, can't see, can't talk, can't interact with, but seemingly the roots and everything he's doing is protecting them and keeping them safe. One thing I do want to mention, because I keep seeing this in my comment section, so, Brandon's got to be nice and explain it to anyone who might be confused. I keep seeing people say, I can't wait to see the boy get revived. So, there's something that has been explained in this show. There's two things that happen when someone dies. Either A, they go to their paradise, which is heaven. Think of what heaven is perceived in our own world. You can pass on and go to your afterlife. We saw what that looked like for Bond. He was a big parade. Everyone was cheering for him, looking at him as amazing before he went back to Fushi. Or you get to keep your spirit and it lingers on, as we've seen from countless spirits. There's certain characters like Reen, who was Gugu's girlfriend, or the boy from episode one. 
Their souls were never with Fushi, meaning they passed on. Those characters can never be revived. So I keep seeing people say, like, I can't wait to see maybe the boy get revived someday, but he can't. He passed on. All the souls that stuck by are the ones who got revived over the course of the past couple of episodes. And the reason why the Immortal Army worked in terms of fending off the knockers is the people who were dying, dying fighting chose to stay behind so they can be revived. Only characters whose spirits that are left behind because they choose to stay behind, plus they have a vessel made for them, can come back. So I just want to throw that out there so there's no one speculating up until season three. I can't wait to see the boy in modern age. No, unfortunately, he passed on. He moved on to his afterlife because that's what he wanted to do. He had no lingering regrets and he wanted to move on. I mean, so I just want to throw that out there because I do see a lot of confusion and I'm kind of tired of answering the same thing in each comment, so... I figure it's best to throw it in the final thoughts here just so people can understand for sure. I don't think that's a bad thing either. I think if every character had the possibility of coming back, it would remove the concept of life. It'll be very interesting to see where Fushi will be mentally after more or less conquering the world in a peaceful way, of course, who he'll choose to bring back. Because if we look at modern civilization in our own world, we can assume it's very similar to this world given architecture and just the general, the, how it looks, right? Humans can be very selfish. So I'm curious to see if potentially anyway, you know, there's going to be this arc or these episodes where maybe characters will stay behind and they'll like beg Fushi to come back. Like, I want to be reborn, but maybe Fushi's like, there's too many people asking for this and maybe he'll really have to play God. I think there's a lot of possibilities to consider about this modern age arc and I'm interested to see what's going to happen. But I love the fact that for decades and upon decades upon centuries just to see the buildings like they're built with the vines on them like something that's just so naturally a part of their world most of these people probably have no idea that a normal building wouldn't have the vines on it but because they grew up in an environment where this legend has been passed on it's just second nature to them it's so cool and i think the montage of seeing them all live fulfilling lives yes some of them got backstabbed protecting and everything like that some went out doing what they love, drinking themselves to death, or dying of old age with their family around them and Fushi's vine coming in to hold his hand. It hit you right in the feels, but I love the fact that as painful, as sad, or as happy as these moments can be, it showed us something, that they lived a second life. And that's why, on one hand, some of these characters, I think, don't need to come back. But on the other hand, I look at how devastated they were with Fushi leaving them, but he had to, right? He had to go across the whole world and he was losing his consciousness, right? So I think there's certain characters that maybe would want to still come back and Fushi's going to turn into Bon and he's going to see them still standing there being like, I thought you would have passed on, but they'll be like, are you an idiot, Fu-chan? Like, we need to be with you for once. So it'll be very interesting to see what they do. The big moment that we do need to talk about is Kaku's selfless sacrifice. Now, the boy is crazy. I mean, the psychopath vibes definitely run in the Hayase family, but absolutely the love was real in terms of how he felt for Fushi. But the psycho killings and things like that, I mean, there was moments that just felt a little too psychopath, and I thought he needed to die. And I, by the end of this arc, I still agree he needed to die. We need to cut off this family's bloodline with the knocker and the fact that he selflessly went to the crazy church, had them make a giant ass fire of molten lava, strapped himself with bombs, he selflessly sacrificed himself and the knocker with it. I thought he was just cutting off the arm to let the knocker run wild. No, he killed the knocker, gaining all those forms back to Fushi and stopping the bloodline once and for all. And when you consider the fact that Kaku was considered a defect, right? You know, Hayase's descendants, they always were females in terms of the one leading. So a male leading this was considered taboo, and you have to prove your entire life that you're worthy to do so. And the fact that the male was the only one to finally break the curse, I really respect that, I have to say. Kaku was a very complex character I loved from start to finish. I think needed to die. I think the whole hierarchy, the whole bloodline, the whole mentality was too twisted and corrupt to have a normal life. But ultimately, I love where it went by the end there, and I just love seeing that scumbag burn. I mean, that sounds mean, but that priest, that bishop, whatever you want to call that dude, he deserved everything and more that he just got. Season 2 was an absolute 10 out of 10, season 1 was a 10 out of 10, and I have no doubt season 3 will be a 10 out of 10, each with their own formula and idea, and I can't wait to review season 3 when it eventually drops. Thoughts and feelings yourself down below, theories if you got any on where season 3 might go next to, let me know, leave a like if you enjoyed, subscribe if you're new around here, ring that bell so you can get notified when I upload on the channel, and of course, we have that full live reaction available on my Patreon, while you're there you can also get a video shoutout. So today, we have Arthur Kunha. Eleanor Bailey Tufts, Ala Ann, and Calvin Atkinson. So I appreciate the support, everyone. Please take care and have a good one.